Hi, this is Outlaw Bookseller and welcome to Reading List Rock, the playlist on my channel where I look at the influence of literature and other culture on rock music. Um, so far, as you'll have seen, I've done loads on The Stranglers, quite a bit on Hawkwind, it's gradually broadening out. Um, and um, because Stranglers fans have been so um, positive, so supportive, a lot of them have subscribed, I'm continuing with this thread on The Stranglers and also they're my favourite band, as I've said before. So um, I thought today I'd talk about um, some characters who pop up in the song No More Heroes and their literary sort of um, antecedents and where they sort of come from in the song. Um, I know I have promised uh, several times now to do a video about um, Victor Hugo's novel Toilers of the Sea, the inspiration for the song Toiler on the Sea from Black and White. And if you've missed other updates I've done recently elsewhere on the channel, I have said that the reason why this has been delayed is because I can't find my copy. So I've had to order a new one. It's taking a while to come. So I want to reread it because I haven't read it for about 20, 25 years. So I need to reread that before we plunge into, you know, going up north and losing her in the fog, as they say. Um, in fact, this isn't a Hollister sweater. This is one of the flock of seagulls, believe it or not. Um, and I think there's, a, there's another one under here. Yeah, there you go. So um, <laughs> that aside, um, I thought we'd talk about um, No More Heroes. As I said, there we go. This is my original um, copy that I bought back in... Um, 77 and it's got the wreath label there as you see which is on a limited quantity and as you see it's signed by Dave Greenfield and twice by JJ Pennell. Quite sure that happened. Um, it happened on the same day um, when I first met the band um, in late October 79 and before the, the, the gig in Cardiff top rank after which he was arrested um, for possession of heroin. So it's quite a historic date in Strangler's mythology really. And of course, it opens to those marvellous lines, whatever happened to Leon Trotsky, he got an ice pick that made his ears burn. I've covered um, Leon Trotsky slightly in another video I did on the strange career of Bernard Wolfe, another one of my Stranglers videos, which has had loads and loads of views. And uh, Bernard Wolfe um, was Trotsky's secretary. And um, there's several connections to Stranglers and Hugh Cornwall songs. So do watch that if you haven't watched it. Um, then, of course, the lyric goes on to sort of name check Elmira, a um, painter who um, sort of basically was a fraud. He um, forged lots of paintings and fooled lots of experts. I know less about the fine arts. I'm not going to talk about him so much. And then we get a mention of Sancho Panza, who I am going to talk about today. And, um, you know, there's the implication of, of the Emperor Nero as well, who watched his Rome burn. And um, we'll talk about Nero another day. But just a quick aside on that, Nero was thought to sort of be like a rather sort of decadent, feckless figure who fiddled while Rome burned. There was probably more he played a liar. But if you actually read Tacitus's Annals of Imperial Rome, um, the way that Nero is sort of depicted in various texts and in Hollywood films is this rather sort of fey, arty character who, you know, didn't get involved with the people. You know, he actually did a good thing when Rome burst into flames. He let people into what was known as the Fields of Mars. So he wasn't such a bad guy after all. But today we're going to talk about Sancho Panza. And a lot of you will know this, but if you don't, um, Sancho Panza is a character from Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. Um, this is quite frankly one of the most important novels published in the history of literature and I would argue maybe the most important novel even though it's not my favorite novel it is really important this is a Penguin Classics copy I've had since gosh I don't know the early 80s and it's got a Picasso, Picasso on the cover there you go and um, I just wanted to talk about that because you think you know who were these heroes they're all actually anti-heroes in the way that they're sort of viewed in um, general life lenny bruce is also mentioned the um potty mouth comedian who was a great believer in the freedom of speech and There's a wonderful film about Lenny Bruce, um, just entitled Lenny, a feature film, a biopic, which stars Dustin Hoffman and um, an absolutely brilliant film. You can get it on Blu-ray and DVD and it's really good. I really urge you to watch it. I watched it way back in the 80s and I've got the soundtrack album, which has things like Miles Davis on it. And it's fantastic. You know, he really went out there on a limb, you know. And
you know he was pilloried by the authorities and he was a heroin addict as well so there's a kind of affinity there with some of the stranglers more ultra explorations of the world of drugs and rock and roll so you know that's there as well but going back to Sancho Panza um, he's a major character in Don Quixote he's effectively the narrator and if you're unfamiliar with Don Quixote I'll just outline the plot briefly because it's a very big book as you see it's about 900 pages and it came, I think he came out about 1605 and Cervantes um, was born they, they don't know the exact date I think it's about 1545 and there was a form of literature in Spain then which was popular called the picaresque. It wasn't actually called the picaresque then, it was called that later on. Uh, it's become known as the picaresque novel. And there were these um, they were these narratives of rather roguish, low-born characters, sort of societies outsiders, and they'd go into all sorts of scrapes and they were often scatological and witty and what have you. So they were sort of they were a bit sort of like punk fiction in a way. Um, and you can get this um, little collection um, from Penguin Classics, which has been in the imprint for years and years and years, called Two Spanish Picaresque Novels. Um, one of them is anonymous. The other one is the, probably the best known one, Lazarillo del Tormes. And I'll just show that up on the screen in a moment for you. So that was the dominant mode of sort of literature in Spain at that time. Obviously a long time ago, it's 500 years. And, um, you know, it was very influential and it sort of spread out into other parts of Europe. And, you know, it's a big part of the history of literature. But Sancho Panza was one of these sort of characters, lowborn, he's an illiterate. Um, and he he works for this, um, this guy called, um, who calls himself Don Quixote. Now, Don Quixote is an ordinary man who's read way too many Arthurian romances. And Arthurian romances were the sort of common form of literature in the late medieval period and throughout Europe, especially in Britain and France. And it spread into Spain. And, you know, one of the classic Arthurian romances are the ones by um, de Troyes, which are basically French. And they all riff on the myths of King Arthur from Dark Ages England. And they're all about courtly love and, you know, and being firm and upstanding and moral and stuff. And they have lots of sort of that sort of thing, they quest narratives, fantasy novels are mostly based on these really. And they were so dominant from, so the picaresque was in a way a kind of reaction against that with these low born characters which we didn't give a damn. And um, Sancho Panza falls in with um, Quixote who has read too many of these romances and he, he loses it a bit and he starts to imagine himself he's a knight so he calls himself Don Quixote and that he de he decides the panza um, panza sort of means belly fat or paunch um, so it's sort of like a pen and he decides the panza is going to be his squire and they're going to go off on his gleaming white horse who's actually an old nag um, called Rosinante and they're going to go around Spain, you know, and they're going to sort of rescue damsels from giants and, um, you know, and, and take them to safety and what have you. And, you know, fulfill all this wonderful chivalric stuff that knights do. And of course, um, I say Don Quixote is completely off his, his, his rocker. And at one point he falls in love with a, uh, with a, a woman who is effectively little more than a prostitute. And um, he, um, Dulcinea, and he sort of regards her as this sort of... Um, gleaming princess and he is the knight in shining armor and it's interesting because what this does is sort of subverts the whole idea of realism versus fantasy and that Don Quixote is this fantasist you know who has these ideas um, which are just absurd because he's read too many fantasy novels and um, you know Sancho Panza is the man who you know sees reality as what it is you know and don't tell me that aesthetics are a subjective view just know the truth when you see it whatever it is, as Bernal sang on Ugly. So um, Panza is sort of like the guy who pulls Quixote out of scrapes all the time. And there's the famous incident in the book where Don Quixote tilts at a windmill. In other words, he pretends the windmill is a monster or a giant and he attacks it with his lance and what have you. And Panza has to sort of help him sort of get out of these sort of scrapes, which are just absurd. So Panzer is a typical picaresque hero. So this is a moment in the history of the novel where 
realism begins to come forward and Cervantes seems to be saying through Panza you know forget all this fantasy nonsense we need you know we need some realism so it's an important book in the sort of birth of the realist novel even though it does have precedence going far back to ancient Rome if you read Petronius's the Satyricon which is fragmentary which is a book you know, it breaks off in mid-sentence. It's about the racy adventures of these two students in Nero's Rome, funnily enough. Um, it's a great book, one of my favourites. And um, the characters in that are rather picaresque. So in, in literature, you know, it, it did develop, but there were people who were way ahead of the times, and Petronius is one. And Cervantes was another. And um, I think I think it was um, sometime after Cervantes was born, um, the next century, with Shakespeare and what have you. So. I once knew a Spanish literature lecturer who said to me, Spanish literature is very small, you know, it's, 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 it's tiny, you know, it's quite pathetic really. But you know, um, I don't want to dispute that because I'm not an expert, but I think that's a bit of a shame to say that, but she's, she's a great woman and um, she would know being an expert. And the fact is though, is that Cervantes did something really important. He sort of made room for the fantastic to be pushed out of realistic fiction so that writers could write strictly realistic realistic narratives and bring things down to earth. I like both myself, so there you go. So clearly um, alongside anti-heroes like Lenny Bruce, like Nero who was painted as being less than he was, um, Elmira the forger who was just as good a painter as the people he, he copied, and um, you know Leon Trotsky who um, really wanted to have a proper socialist revolution who was done down by Smirsch. You can see how he fits in the Strangler's canon of anti-heroes. So that's, um, that's a little insight into Cervantes and Sancho Panza and the picaresque novel. And um, you know obviously at the time when we listened to the track you know it was refreshing to sort of come across people who were our heroes, but they were anti-heroes, and that's the thing. And the anti-hero is a really important figure in Western culture, especially in the last 150 years, where, you know, sometimes the people who are outside of society are the people who are doing the most heroic work, really. It's easy to conform. It's more difficult to be an outsider. So that's my thoughts, really, on Sancho Panza um, and Cervantes in reference to No More Heroes. Um, as I say, this is a bit of an interim. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, do let me have your comments and what have you. And um, I think a quick spin of the old single is up next. And this is Outlaw Bookseller signing out for now.